not the pastor of this church. So Rubishi says, well, you'd like to give an explanation um, that, like I mentioned before, it's not directly related to Mahamudra, but it's, he would like to um, explain, he would like to explain Sugata, the term Sugata. So uh, basically it means the one who's gone to well-being, who's gone beyond to bliss, who's gone beyond to happiness. It can be translated in all these different ways. So Sugata, which is like, a, a state of mind is bliss or well-being or happiness, whatever you want to call it. Well, um, if, if, if there's something, if there are certain aspects that are there, 
you have this kind of bliss, this kind of well-being. And if these aspects are not there, you won't experience it. So what is it that keeps you from experiencing that kind of well-being, that kind of bliss or happiness? Well, it's the fabrications. It's the fabrications of the conceptual objects, the fabrication of the conceptual minds, the coarser types of minds, whichever way you want to take it. So is these all these different aspects, all these different thoughts, basically. So it's these conceptual thoughts, it's these different fabrications, mental fabrications that are responsible, that prevent us from experiencing that type of bliss and happiness. And so the seventh Dalai Lama, Gyawakya Sangyatso, or the the, the yeah the seventh Dalai Lama Gelsan Gyatso as he's called in one of his songs of experience he 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 quoted or he he no he gave this 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 verse he cited this or he sorry he composed this verse as part of one of his songs of experience and the verse basically reads as follows having attained this human body uh, due to having accumulated virtue so that's the first line, having a, having a, attained a human body, the body of a human being, independence, of course, on having accumulated uh, virtuous karma, negative, positive actions and so forth, having refrained from negative ones, etc. Well, having attained such a human body, uh, if one is not satisfied, if one is not satisfied with all the, the if, if the mind is not satisfied with all types of objects so for instance uh, food and and clothing and so forth so in general uh, there's some people they're totally satisfied just having uh basic food having ba basic clothing having a roof over your head and so forth so just being happy being satisfied with someone who's not satisfied in such a way so despite having attained this human body, if we're not satisfied with the different objects, with all sorts of things such as food and clothing, etc. And we're tied up. We're uh, we're tied up by this continuum of expectations and worry. We're tied up by this this continuum of expecting this and expecting that, wanting this, not wanting that, having certain expectations, and constantly worrying about this, that, and the other. So it's this continuum, these constant expectations, constant worries, if we're kind of tied up, we're bound, if we're bound up by that. Well, that is a state of self-torture. This is the way we torture ourselves. So in other words, if we have attained, having attained this human body, so really what what uh, Gyawakya Sangyatso, the seventh Dalai Lama is saying, he's saying, having attained this human body, uh, independence on having accumulated virtue, if, if we're not satisfied with the different things in life, if we have no satisfaction, we find no contentment with regard to the different objects in life, and instead are constantly are tied up, are bound by this continues by these continuing uh expectations and worry that's where indeed that's when we're indeed uh, torturing ourselves we're indeed experiencing uh these these different self-creative problems and that is not necessary we don't need this we, we really don't need this if we think about it i mean now being born as a human being we're human if we are in our room Everything is fine. We've got food, we've got clothing. If then we look out of the window, we see this dog, you know, this dog coiled up sleeping there. Well, think about it. We may be thinking about this, that, and the other, being worried, etc. But this dog is very happily just asleep, not worrying about anything, just coiled up. And actually, well, I'm a human being. That's a dog. I mean, I have so many uh, possibilities as a human being. I have a higher rebirth as a... Mm -hmm. 
先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们先生,我们
So, um, first of all, I now got the text. Um, I, I received a few messages from Venerable Yume and so forth. So thank you very much for that. There is the, the, the auto commentary is available in English. It's called the stages of the path and the oral transmission. Uh, stages of the path and the oral transmission. Unfortunately, I can't display it on the um, on the on the screen. Uh, it's available on Amazon.com. Anyway, um, so here I, I'll just read the verse again. I'm going to use my translation right now because I'm a little bit more familiar with it. But I'm sure Tukta Jimba's translation is much better. Anyway, so I bow respectfully at the feet of my incomparable guru, accomplished master of adepts, who plainly reveals Mahamudra, the all-pervading nature of everything, the indivisible, indescribable, and indestructible sphere of mind. So this is uh, is the first. And then he goes on to say, Jubeguota Dewat Munatane Konanso, Tambonet, with Gibato Joba, two cent in Miduas, Sanke Jumden, the Lamdejigo, Ne, Yamsulene, Arahat singing the Dachumba, Yomo be developed to attend to Dava singing the top to us. The Naya T. J. Stun, tell me Petebegone, and Yamsulambegone, and Tarva singing the Nirvana Sati, the top to Yachi Ravas, the T. Imbati, and Tandadi, the leg conjunct the Yomo Bukunjuni, the Sesona, Tarva Topsar Ratas, Ledan Yomo Sevetars. Now, Ledan Yomo, the country in the Chumbar is saying to me, Jig and Namdolten, Chunguaris, Led the Karich in the Sagi Orsana, to me, Jig and Namdolten, less Sagi Ors. Ah, Yomo, but to me, Jig and Namdolten, young words, Chadant, to me, Jig and Namdolten, young words, to me, Jig and Namdoti, any. Dinzing travel ten young yards. Dinzing singing tea and my java shows in Molang Jamne, my java chagumaris. Caught on Zindang Mos Gavachigi and in Yambucheva Gone and Pongoris. Tinde Indu Tata Trule, Trubanis, that Dinzing Trubati, Tongba Niki Gabarjus, or Tuni Tobe Yishig Tobji and Yantabe Ishi Ton Tobji, Chinjilog, Lodin Zin in the Kagres, Tomba Niki Gabriels. Taya Yahagi Sanstegi in Rodan Chigitone, Kunulamarum Jusungu Yusungu Dua Yashino, Tomba Ni Du Gabriels, Tomba Niki Sena Lamde, Tomba Ni Tusen and Gordon, or the Tus Cheje, and Walam Nigitone, 
ten to dawa top to res, yum but double trawat chatu res, or tatigi, but nezu chasanji sungudua, or ten day inza, tambotan, the tigjela, jube gotan, shunshinchi, katam tigza maimbe, camdo semgen and denja, camdo chego is a carre, or dawa do, dongemindu, that dawa toto carres, or tindu, sanje conjo, lambda imba, chu conjo, the one a capuba, migbet gindu chet. Tolia, Migu Drugio, Gindu, Migu Drugio, or the two Cheney, Nanzo Sanjo going to choke in the Gindu Tiosu, the two Serechevim. So then Rubichi read the, you know, the uh, promise to compose the text. I will write an instruction on my mother from the oral tradition of the supremely accomplished Dharma Vajra and the spiritual children and so forth. The second verse. Um, so Rubichi said, We explained this before, or Rubichi explained it before. There's no need to explain it again. Um, and then the auto commentary also says, with regard to those two verses, the meaning of these two stanzas is not difficult to comprehend, so I will not expand on them. So then the explanation of the actual text, the composed text, or the actual instructions, it goes on to say. Um, so here, as for the actual presentation of the instructions by means of preliminaries, the main part in the conclusion, um, there are three parts, the preparation, the main practice, and the concluding practice. So the preparation, the first is presented in the following line. I will write, this is now, sorry, this is uh, verse number three. Regarding this, there are three outlines, the preliminaries, the actual practice, and the conclusion. As for the first, the preliminaries, sincerely, without it being just words coming from your mouth, or just words, uh, just your mouth and you, you and coming with these I mean, words coming from them, take refuge because it is the gateway to entering the Dharma and generate bodhicitta for it is the central pillar of the Mahayana. Now, with regard to the meaning of what is said here, so the preliminary is to take refuge and then to generate bodhicitta. But why to take refuge? What is the need for taking refuge? What is the reason for taking refuge? And so basically we talk about taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, Sangha, uh, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, sorry, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Now, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, well, who's the Buddha? The Buddha is the person, is the being who shows us the path. Well, what is the Dharma? The Dharma refers to the elimination or the, the, um, the abandonment or the, yeah, the elimination, the removal of suffering. That's what we want to remove. How do we remove it by way of removing what causes them the afflictive emotions? So it's that cessation, the cessation of afflictive emotions. And how do we reach this? Well, how do we get to such a state? By way of the path, which is taught by the Buddha. So the Buddha teaches us the path to overcoming suffering, to attaining um, the cessation of suffering. Therefore, the Buddha is the person showing us the path. Then the, the cessation of suffering and the path that leads us there, that is the Dharma. And of course, we may feel, oh, I can't do this. I can't attain such a state. However, it is through examples. So the Sangha now, examples such as Shariputra, Magalayana, and so forth, all these great beings in the past who were just like us, who were just ordinary beings at some point in time. And then by way of putting into practice what the Buddha has taught, they attained the state of an arhat, of a foe destroyer, and so forth. So that gives us that gives us the inspiration to work hard ourselves, to understand I can reach that same state. They are an example for me. I can do that. I can attain the state of nirvana, and so forth. Furthermore, um, Rinpoche explains, well, there's this verse from Nagarjuna's fundamental wisdom um, in which it says, uh, due to the removal, because of removing karma and afflictions, there's an end. There's an end, end to suffering. There's an end. Karma and afflictions um, originate in uh, in conceptual in, in misconceptions. These have their, their these have their origin in mental fabrication. Fabrications uh, end. Uh, through uh, emptiness or within emptiness. So this particular verse, first it tells us because everything has been, every all our experiences, our sensoric experiences, since they have their 
origin in karma and afflictions, there's an end to suffering. We can overcome suffering. So it is this, it's karma and afflictions which are responsible for all our trouble, all our difficulties. Now, karma and, and afflictions, so in particular, aff afflictions themselves, they have their origin in the misconception. So here the misconception uh, refers to the exaggerating uh, attitude, the inappropriate attitude as it's sometimes translated, or uh, this kind of exaggerating type of mind, exaggerate, exaggerating um, the aspect of phenomena. So exaggerating the positive aspect, the negative aspect of phenomena, in other words. And where does that come from, that exaggerating attitude? Well, this has its origin in mental fabrication. In other words, in the mind that perceives true existence, that grasps at true existence. It's the fabrication of the misperception of reality, of grasping at, at an unrealistic way of which phenomena cannot possibly exist. And it's only by way of understanding that the object of this misperception, of that ignorant type of mind, that that doesn't exist. So that, in other words, inherent existence doesn't exist. It's so only by understanding the lack of inherent existence or emptiness that we can actually uh, end these, these fabrications, these mental fabrications in the form of the root misperception. Now, in Sanskrit, there are two ways in which to, to translate the last line, which is fabrications and uh, either through emptiness or within emptiness. Both The Sanskrit allows for both interpretations. So if you were to read the last line of this verse to say fabrications and through emptiness, you're indicating the path, the, the path of realizing emptiness, that path consciousness would realize this emptiness. Through that method, through that path consciousness, you can eliminate fabrications, you can eliminate the misperception and all the resulting uh, other fabric, um, afflictive emotions. Or you can take it to mean uh, all the fabrications, they are ended within emptiness. Within emptiness, and here referring to the cessation, to the cessation of suffering. So within the cessation here, so within emptiness, sorry, so fabrications ending uh, within emptiness, that refers to the cessation itself, taking it from the point of view of the cessation. Now, either way, you can read it this way or that way, this is actually based on the uh, interpreted with the explanation of Kunalama Rinpoche. Kunalama Rinpoche was an expert in Sanskrit. Uh, he has explained that the last line in particular can be read to mean emptiness ends uh, through, sorry, fabrications end through emptiness or within emptiness. Anyway, the point is that eventually we can all attain such a state. We can attain the state of Nirvana. We can, in other words, eliminate all these obstructions, all these, um, well, first of all, uh, afflictive emotions rooted in the misperception, which then give rise to karma and the different types of sufferings. And it is in dependence on relying. So by relying on Buddha Dharma Sangha, relying on, well, first of all, the Buddha who's taught us the path, who's taught us how to, to uh, practice and so forth. And secondly, by relying on the Dharma, which is the path itself, which refers to the path itself, as well as the resulting cessation of afflictions. And of course, then the Sangha, the Sangha who shows us how to do it, who are an example, who, whose example uh, helps us to then put into practice what is taught. Oh, <laughs> Bang 
Tuzung hai mi bel ten ne tang ang ngon ta ne chuyen nhem len chi ta go lam gi yen de yu lam ma jeu jeu che a tin de chi ta le ya be chen chi gi yi sa chi gi ta nang ang zu jam du jam du sa de ta de ba ge to ni yong a ru as de ba sa ti kan de chi ngo kan de re se in du ta we de ba yi che gi de ba ngun de gi de ba s zam bu ling chu lu cha me na la ta we de ba yu yu bu re o ti ya bu du sa me de yu yu bu re ti Then they look at some Egypt, the other day, Chulu Taman and Rangi, Japsu, still ten day yore. That when do you get Taba singing the Chulu Taman of Meduas? Oh, the Nambeshun Narimuduas, or Sanje Karana Shiji, Naya Chis, Narazam de Maseve, Semje and Tamje, Toba Sanje Yukoma, Sanje Karana Shiji, and Toba Shos, or that Susu Karangi and the Tinashi, not do you use. Or top and do dos, or ten to the other top and do dos, Mundus, or ten digit tone, Tango, Mundu, Yichesungi, and the Danigi Matevi Nemojigle, and the Tabet singing Shaggy or Jasun Local, or ten digit tone. Ten de inza, than the Jabs Chisati, than the Moose, San Jesabada, Moose, Golam Gionanji, Yedeva Tuzolea, and Gibbs. That in a Mong Balianga San Jigi. Mong Bali Neng Yulia Chu Kunjo Yundegin Karsal Nyomumbada, Shij Duba Maluba Trebe, Trawa Gogden Mondu Chiagi, Tindekiti, Susu Tandanine, Betu Tang, Raval Cheni, Dwayatigi, Tindemi Yuti, and Jacobs, Tobjan Dibulia, and each chen. And Chigis and Jacobs, or Tinde Duas, or Tindin Kaps Chisad, Chulu Tamalola Yeva Rede, Kaps Chidam Mindawa. You kept the job singing, ye up. Tabachita Chulu Tamala Yorde, Mundu Gitaba singing Titi, young Tumu Maiba Jiuzuchi, or Rava Tumu Maiba Jiuzuchi, or that Tunzutone, Tambutan that Tijan Jubu go Shunshin Chis, and eh? Gundo Sung Jason Dorati, and Gure Sungati, that Timbre. ולכן כשאנחנו חוזרים שוב לטקסט המקור. כזה נציג זה מהים בי, גם לא סמגי נדן ג'אסטה, או גם לא תתן לו סמגי תנדל לב יורה. ולכן כשחוזרים לטקסט המקור שאומר, למדריך הזה יש שלושה חודשים. 70 verses of refuge. I think that's what Rishi said. Anyway, he gave this quote uh, in which he says that um, the, the method to achieving liberation, the method to achieving um, the, the state of liberation of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, so it's taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, that is the goal, really. The goal is that state of liberation. So it's not in order to gain uh, health and wealth and, 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 and being able to um, make a living and so forth, that's not the goal of taking refuge. It's not these kind of temporary goals that we're, uh, that it's not, it's not the goal to gain these temporary happiness in this life. That is not why we're taking refuge. Instead, the actual goal is to eliminate suffering by eliminating its root cause. So what is its root cause? Well, it's the afflictive emotions. That's where all suffering uh, comes from. So the cause of all our trouble are the afflictive emotions, in particular, the misperception of reality. And that elimination, that overcoming, that elimination of suffering by way of eliminating its cause is described as the, the, the refuge or the, the Dharma jewel. The three jewels being the object of refuge, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha being the three jewels. So the Dharma jewel, that is that elimination. It's that state that we ourselves strive to attain, that we aspire towards. So this is based on what is called strong faith. That's what we usually associate with taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, like having faith. Ah, it's important to understand what is really meant with faith because there are three types of faith. So the three types of faith are usually translated as believing faith, pure faith, and aspirational faith. So believing faith and believing in something, believing it to be true, etc. 
uh, then you have this pure faith, which is a kind of devotional, joyful kind of faith. And you've got aspiration of faith. So the first two types, believing faith and, and pure faith or devotional kind of faith, you find in other tra traditions. Yes, in other religions. So in other religions, believers, they have faith in the teachings of this particular religion. They're devoted to this religion. They, they have uh, devotion, worship, and so forth. All that is given. But the last type, this aspirational type of faith, is a type of faith where you aspire towards reaching the same goal. So this is unique to Buddhism in the sense that I want to become like you. I want to become like the teacher himself. In this case, the Buddha, I want to become like the Buddha. I want to achieve that same state. So that is the kind of faith we are talking about here. Not just the first two, the, 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 not just the first two types of faith, they're just believing faith and devotional or pure faith. No, we're also talking about aspiration of faith to aspire towards such a state the sense i want to become like you and that's why i rely on you that's why i take refuge in you and here taking refuge again has two aspects we talk about causal refuge and we talk about resultant refuge the two types of refuge in other words causal refuge in the sense yeah we take refuge in buddha dharma sangha outside of ourselves in the sense of other beings and uh, the, the, the Dharma and beings such as the Sangha who show us, who guide us, who show us the path, who show us the way and who guide us. But then there's also what is called resultant refuge. Resultant refuge in the sense of, I can do this. I will do this. I can and I will practice in such a way. I will make put an effort. I will make an effort so that myself, I will reach such a state myself. I will reach such a resultant state. Therefore, you take refuge in your own uh, kind of future state, in your own state, uh, your own Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, which is why this is important to understand here. Taking refuge has these different aspects. You have, first of all, the aspect of aspirational faith, that needs to be taken into consideration that based on aspiration of faith, you take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. It needs to be emphasized. And secondly, it's not just that we take refuge in the cause of refuge, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha outside of ourselves, but we also take refuge in our future resultant states, in our future Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So on that basis, when it says take refuge, when it says here in the text, Regarding the, this, there are three outlines, the preliminaries, the actual practice, and the conclusion. As for the first, sincerely, without it being just words coming out of your mouth, take refuge. Why? Because it is the gateway to entering the Dharma. So that explains why it is important, what is the need for, and why it is important to take refuge. But uh, some <laughs> Tindichi need 
ตาติตานใช้เวลาซึ่งเนี่ยตัวตรงเงินนั้นเนี่ยคนอันตัวคนอันจะเล็กสานนะนักยอร์งาชุดอกการยอร์เซอร์จูมาอิมบะโอ้
Well, it is through two ways. There are two ways. One is to understand their suffering. And secondly, is seeing them as endearing, seeing sentient beings as precious and therefore wishing them to be free from suffering. So those are the two aspects, understanding suffering and its causes uh, or understanding how sentient beings are suffering and what they're suffering from, their actual uh, predicament, understanding that. And because of our feeling of closeness and the sense that they're so precious, based on that, we then have the wish for them to be free from that. We develop that sense of being free. So we need both. We need an understanding of suffering, of their suffering, and we need this feeling of closeness, perceiving sentient beings as endearing and precious. How do we get to that point? Well, we get to that point by fast understanding, of course, suffering. I mean, suffering not just based on what suffer, I mean, suffering of sentient beings, but here we need to apply it to ourselves, perceive, understand our predicament, understand we're caught in samsara, we're caught in cyclic existence. We need to understand the nature of cyclic existence. There is no real happiness to be found. So Rubishi really stressed that. There is no real happiness that is can be found in samsara. No way can we find that type of well-being that we're, we're looking for, that we're striving for. This we need to understand first of all. But based on ourselves, understanding samsara, the nature of samsara, the nature of cyclic existence on the basis of ourselves, and then to develop the wish to be free from samsaric suffering, samsaric suffering and its causes. That is called renunciation. So before we can focus on sentient beings, before we can focus on all sentient beings, well, we first need to focus on ourselves. So to switch it around, in other words, Rumshi used this term like to switch it around. Before we can really focus on all sentient beings, we focus on ourselves, understand suffering and its causes, and develop the wish, may I be free from samsaric habit, some samsaric suffering and its causes. And then we switch again. Once we have a deep sense of the, the predicament we are we, we, we ourselves are in, like this misery and suffering and so forth, the different types of suffering of samsara, in other words, well, then we switch it around. And so whereas previously we ourselves wanted to be free from that as a natural consequence of understanding samsara, then we switch it around. And now we want for all sentient beings to be free from this. So we familiarize with suffering based on ourselves and then switch it around towards all sentient beings and, and develop then the wish for them to be free from suffering. So by switching around our focus from going myself, may I be free from this? And that kind of mind is described as renunciation. We switch it around towards focusing on all sentient beings and wishing for them to be free from all types of sufferings and its causes. And that is called compassion. So it's really just a matter of switching your focus that you go from renunciation to compassion. But the point is here, so that the step of wishing for sentient beings, generating compassion towards sentient beings as a means to um, cultivating bodhicitta, well, what is this? It's like our we have to generate a sense of closeness towards sentient beings to actually wish them to be free from suffering. It's not like, oh, it's their karma, tough luck. They need to deal with it. It's their problem. That's not the reaction uh, we should have. Instead, we should consider sentient beings to be really precious. Sentient beings are extremely precious. And so it says, for instance, in Nagarjuna, for instance, uh, says in his uh, precious garland, and um, I just happen, happen to remember the verse number is 484, uh, verse number 484, and that uh, Nagarjuna says, may all sentient beings um, may all sentient beings consider me as precious as their own life or oh, no may, may all sentient may i um may i um uh, consider sentient beings as precious as they once would consider their own life may i consider all sentient beings so precious as they would their own life so we all consider our own life to be extremely precious. We would do anything for our own life. And sentient beings um, consider their own life to be very precious. In that same way, may I regard sentient beings, may I consider them to be so precious just as they consider their own life. That kind of sense of closeness, that kind of sense of affection, 
That's what we try to develop, the sense of closeness, seeing them as so extremely precious, really appreciating uh, sentient beings, uh, appreciating, they, appreciating them for who they are. And once we can do that, once we have that sense of closeness, this feeling of closeness and considering them to be so precious, then we have the natural sense, may they be free from suffering, may they be free from any type of suffering. And that leads us to this aspiration of their like aspiring towards their benefit. That's one of the element elements of bodhicitta. So you wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering on the basis of understanding their suffering and considering them to be so precious. You have that sense, may they be free from suffering, therefore great compassion. And that gives rise to the wish for their well-being, the first element of bodhicitta. And based on that wish, you then generate the wish yourself to become enlightened. And from there, you go from aspiration of bodhicitta to engaging bodhicitta and so forth. Now, with regard to considering sentient beings to be precious, to have that sense sentient beings are truly precious. Well, if we think about it, um, for instance, Shantideva has said that right now we consider our own body to be extremely precious, our own five of our own aggregate, our physical aggregate, I mean, our physical body. But as Shantideva has said, this body is just like renting a room. For some time, you have this body. It's like renting a room in a guest house. So for some time, you, you spent within this vessel, which is called the body. But actually, what, what is it really? Like, well, our body 
the substance, the actual substance, the actual physical entity of our body comes from our parents. So it's the two substances, the semen, the uh, the, the the egg from the mother and so forth. I mean the semen and over uh, uh, anyway so all these substances as they're usually described the white and the red substance they coming together and grow into this body and so as these two substances from the father the semen from the mother uh, father and so forth as they come together the substances from our parents our consciousness due to causes and conditions certain causes and conditions coming together our mind happens to enter this particular, happens to connect with this particular physical basis. And it is through familiarity, associating this mind with this body. We became familiar with that. It's like we, we took a room and slowly grew familiar with this room. As Shantideva says, it's like renting a room. So similarly here, it's like we, 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 we took ownership of this body and we grew familiar with it associating a feeling feeling of connected to this body it's just a matter of familiarity which shows us that our mind in the same way as it grew familiar to our body if it grew familiar with thinking oh this is my body this is my body so it became familiar with the sense this is my body and considering it precious because of that strong connection. Well, in the same way, our mind has the capacity to do this with other sentient beings. We can do exactly the same thing, just as we felt really, as, as we had a sense that sent, as, as our body is precious, we can have a sense of all sentient beings being precious. It's just a matter of familiarity. Because, well, for instance, with our body, first of all, we connect it our mind connected to our body there through familiarity we have a sense this is my body and because we can see that it's precious in the sense that well since we have a body there's certain things we can do i can move from one place to another i can accomplish certain things all based on this body so understanding that it's very helpful to me therefore i consider it to be precious and i i hold on to this body as something precious as something valuable it's a natural reaction. But we can do the same with sentient beings, growing familiar with the sense that sentient beings are really precious and then holding them dear, holding them close, considering them precious and acting accordingly. Because this is also said, this was also said by Shantideva, the degree of their, their preciousness, if you like. So Shantideva, basically, he, in two lines, he basically said that all the trouble in this world all the problems, all the faults of samsara have their origin in the self-centered attitude. Whereas all the happiness, all the well-being, all the satisfaction, all that has its origin in cherishing others. So it's these, these two lines, really. It's like a summary of everything he had said earlier. So all the suffering originates in, all the suffering comes from the self-centered attitude, all the happiness comes from cherishing others. It's only these two lines. But if you think about it, it's so profound. It's so profound that all our well-being comes from sentient beings and all our suffering, well, comes from cherishing sentient beings, comes from sentient beings, whereas our self-centered attitude that is responsible for all our trouble. And we live in society. We live with other sentient beings. Therefore, if, if, if what we want is happiness and we don't want to suffer, well, it becomes clear that this is the way to accomplish what we desire, to, to, to accomplish well-being, to accomplish happiness. That is the only way. Of course, if we're not interested, that's a different matter. But if we're really interested in that, if we really, um, well, are interested in finding a way to overcome suffering, to find... Uh, happiness and so forth, to really follow that kind of uh, way of overcoming suffering, etc. Debar 
се диги мицеринва. Любо дева. Йон стова, съм ден шен ли той не е юнга ю девачки. Та ти се диги кече че. Кевара чимара чаша бейна. Манзун гондо сачи. Несон ли митун сачи. Гондо ли тотап. Несон ли митун я. Чимбата чужим кече че кече че че тоне жуго аре. Шен ли неба ши там че ли доба че кече тоне чужим юнгу аре. Теги ти съм ден шен сенге диги кардин дене. Гондо сенге диги. Кева чима гондо сенге де дел дене. Нили тарва сенге де лаба сунгу нямне че ги тоне юнгу аре. Ко тиян сем ден шен дене. Та тене ламе зоба санге ги компан сенге тиян сем ден шен дене юн дене. Сан ге цане шен дюн беме лунду се де сем ден шен мена юн да ме дене. Кандар те тене че ги сам дама инна де сем ден шен сенге де тене де гише лангри тамбе сунба наши, ланг тамба дожи сенге сунба наши. Та не сем ден там че ла иши нобу ле ла бес. Та иши ги нобу рум че сенге че ги тин сан де айо ме миши. Та пе на дега си че ги че чун че ги дожи палам че ги юна та замбу ли ги нана. Та ке ра ша е че ги рва та. Че чун дега си че ги дожи палам че ги юна. О, та тинде че юе бе инна я ко че ди ги ани че 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 дуя ла пен до че му да за че му че бара ма до че ги. Телле тре бе кеба че ма са е че ги ко ю кан я че е че ми дума. Та сем че ги шен сен ги ди ди да че ги ли тарба да там че юон су зоба. Ani telat tu sebab cuma yang dia baca dia tiri telat dia ni, yang dia ni jenis Hindu. Ishi nabi lelha be, tuan cakap dua belas sampai ini sahdi, dah khas niang agi, cik niang buat jawab siapa main ba. Sama dengan dia main na, mana babi hadu sedang gua aja ki. Oh, ini jenis rede duas. Oh, tiri Hindu, jeshin pun be yang sengen de, dah khas raja raja kerja main ba. Mereka ni juga tuh begi, jeshin pun be yang tu tanya aja duas. Now, based on that, if we really have an interest in that, we will get an irreversible conviction of the precious nature of sentient beings, how precious they are to us. It, that we are naturally, we will reach a point where we can naturally let go and have a spontaneous sense. Yes, I need to benefit, I need to benefit sentient beings. I need to dedicate myself towards the welfare of sentient beings. And then Rinpoche uh, continued on to say, well, if you just think on a daily basis, having a cup of tea in the afternoon, having a bowl of food or whatever, like a, a snack in the afternoon, well, all this, just the simple, the simple uh, snack is dependent on how many sentient beings, endless sentient beings were involved in the production and so forth of that particular snack. And so, This is just from the point of view of this one food item, that kind of snack. But if we think about it, if we think about it, all our food, all the food we eat all the time, it's dependent on so many sentient beings, their efforts, etc. The clothing we wear, the, the clothes we wear in our body, again, so many sentient beings are involved, their efforts, etc. And then think about your qualities, like your your well, your your education. The, the kind of mental qualities that you developed over time is all dependent on the sentient beings, your education, your knowledge, etc. Your health, staying healthy, living a long life, all this without all the sentient beings, it would be impossible. And this is just from the point of view of this life, just from the point of view of this very existence in this life, so many sentient beings are responsible for our well-being. And then think of our next life. I mean, being reborn in a higher state, in a higher state, such as, well, being reborn human in, the, in one of the happy realms, a human existence as a celestial being and so forth. Well, in order to be reborn there, the causes for that are virtuous actions. But how do we, how do we practice virtuous actions such as um, generosity, such as as ethical discipline, we need other sentient beings to be able to practice, to be generous, to be virtuous and so forth. And likewise, in terms of liberation, to become liberated, we need to engage in the three trainings. And again, we need other sentient beings uh, in order to be able to practice this. And then Buddhahood, well, it's very clear that with regard to Buddhahood, also, we need all sentient beings to be able to cherry sentient beings to be able to generate this deep love this compassionate and eventually effortless this spontaneous and effortless 
uh, compassion that we'll be able to, to generate. Well, it's only for other sentient beings. It's independence of other sentient beings that we can generate those qualities in order to eventually uh, reach the state of a Buddha. So it is as Geshe Langji Tamba said, for instance, in his eight verses of mind training or eight verses of Lojong mind training. He said, um, sentient beings are more precious and sentient beings are more precious than the wish fulfilling jewel. I will work for their benefit. So in the sense that, well, a wish fulfilling jewel, it's kind of difficult. It's like this mythical, this kind of myth mythical kind of object that fulfills all your material wishes. But let's imagine, so Rimshi picked up this, uh, I think it's called like a singing bowl. He picked it up and said, imagine you have a diamond the size of this bowl. I mean, it's so valuable and you can get so much money for it and can um, do so much with this kind of uh, value, with this kind of uh, money you get from it. But it only benefits you in this lifetime. But sentient beings are even more precious than such a diamond, than, than a wish-fulfilling jewel that can fulfill all your material wishes. Because sentient beings, they benefit you in this lifetime, but also benefit you in your next lifetime. They benefit you in the way described earlier. So sentient beings are so much more than So that completes the, the today's, oh, sorry, I should stop. ตักชิคังซาอันตักชิพุงโซตักชิคังซาพอตินเดตินเดเจนิลงเจจาตะเจบอบอตินเดกทอนชุนยินเตนเบยอเรเรเตตะเนชุนยินเตนเบยาติต
stem singing the Kandijiduas. So therefore, So therefore, she said previously, okay, so in order to really understand that, that sentient beings, so we need to understand that sentient beings are more precious than the wish for fully and jewel to really generate that sense of their of them being endearing, of being precious, of being close to us. Anyway, now it's time to do the meditation. So we'll do a meditation on the mind. Uh, well, it says, for instance, in the text, we should see the suchness of the mind. Later on in one of the verses, it talks about um, becoming aware of the suchness of the mind. Now, usually when we think of um, the emptiness or the suchness of objects, well, we think about a table and a chair, for instance. We take the eye, which is uh, the object that is being labeled, or we take the aggregates, the five aggregates, which are the basis for labeling eye. So whether it's the I, the person, that is that which is labeled, or the five aggregates, which is the basis, well, we focus on that and uh, come to understand its suchness. I mean, understand um, how how they exist. But here and now, when we talk about Mahamudra, in Mahamudra, the object is the mind. It is the suchness of the mind. So first of all, what is this mind, this basis? It's the basis of its own suchness. So. We need to understand the mind just from a conceptual level, from a conventional level, from the point of view of like the mind being happy, the mind not being happy. So there are different types of mind, therefore. But we're not talking about these different types of consciousness, the different ways in which the mind manifests, if you like, or the mind arises, but rather the mind itself. What is the nature, just the conventional nature of the mind itself, of being clear and knowing? or having the aspects of clarity and awareness. So here we want to meditate on that. We want to spend a few moments on just that, how to, what is the nature of the mind? We're not used to it. It's really difficult to even explain the nature. We need to use terminology that is usually used for physical objects to explain the nature of the mind. Uh, but what it is said here, without considering past objects and future objects, without being concerned with past and futures, to just be in the moment and just recognize that clarity, that awareness. And Rupert says, for me, it's even difficult to explain this, what the mind really is, but I've taken on the responsibility. I've kind of um, agreed to doing so. Now I need to do it. But basically, what we're trying to do is recognize that clarity and awareness. For a short moment, just for a short moment. Uh, and then once we're able to do it for a short moment, we try to extend. We try to extend the time. We can focus on that. Free from laxity and excitement. So trying to not being affected by laxity and excitement and just focus on the mind. To just focus on the mind that is it's, its nature of clarity and awareness to try to get a glimpse of that. Get a glimpse of that in order to then extend that, to, to be able to focus on that. And that is the beginning of generating shamatha, shamatha with regard to the mind, focusing on the mind. So therefore, you focus on the mind in the sense of getting a glimpse, hopefully getting a glimpse of the clarity and aware aspect of the mind. Focus on that suchness of the mind. And once you're able to find the object, you then focus on it, if you can, for a longer period of time. So this is not yet shamatha, of course, but you are taking the first step towards doing this. So this is what it is, and this is what I would uh, like you to do. I would like you to focus on just that clarity and awareness um, by way of focusing just on the mind itself, and thereby these two aspects, the mind being clear, the mind being aware. Focus on that as long as you can. Um, and then once you, well, focus on it, get a sense of the object, first of all, recognize, identify that object, get a glimpse of it and focus on it. That is what we're uh, going to do now as part of the, the meditation.
tende rate nyamalas tende tumati shimbalas tende kala te rot ngarlas tende lulu rivjati khoe din jambalas ta tuzo kanga si ingyu jambo thonya nyambo thonya tuzo kanga sheba chik thone yungu yorete ina yanko Suching church the Dene Drogodos. That tender my imba, Suching church, Kaya Mandeva. Says a rich on Gisheva, Sandy, Tanga Moshnia, Pesuching some that drink on Yatagindas. So to add a tiny explanation, like to, to add a little bit more. Well, first of all, when it comes to our mind, we perceive things such as, oh, a pleasant color, um, a melodious sound. Um, a pleasant smell, a delicious uh, food, delicious food, or a soft kind of tangible object. So it's the five sense objects we perceive, for instance, flashes, uh, pleasant, pleasant uh, sense objects. But here, those are all physical objects. So the mind, the object of the mind are physical objects. Here, we want to let go of any kind of physical object. So instead of holding on to anything physical, all I want you to focus on is the clarity and the awareness of the mind. Don't. No. So I want you to also not close your eyes. I mean, naturally, when we start to meditate, we naturally want to just close our eyes. But you should keep your eyes open. And at some point, the objects that appear to you, well, they're just appearances without you actually being aware of them. So it becomes like, um, to your mind, they're just aware. It becomes an awareness to which the object appears, but it's not, not ascertained. So allow your eyes to be open because otherwise if you close them it'll give rise to laxity and so that's an obstacle uh, therefore keep them open please start to meditate so please meditate
So that should should do it. She says there's the danger that my head falls down. That my head falls off. Or that the head falls off. Anyway, so we're done for today. Please uh, look up this book, the translation by Gishtuptin Jimba of the commentary, Stages of the Path and the Oral Transmissions. Stages of the Path and the Oral Transmissions. And then we meet again in the afternoon. She said, see you again in the afternoon for the second session. Thank you.